So uh, my name is Dorian Liebmunner from UC Berkeley. And you know, basically, this MEM stuff is very overblown. No, just joking. <laughs> my students would love to hear that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about microneedles and things, um, and also where MEMS might play a role. I wasn't positive about the, the microrobotics. I mean, one place where MEMS might work is because we're very small. There's very little inertia. So the idea is instead of having, for example, the surgeries that work on the heart where everything is moving back and forth to stay with the heart, moving heart, you could actually just sort of land a very light device on the heart, and it would actually stay there while things are moving. Of course, then you'd have to do the image processing issue of trying to follow that so the surgeon doesn't go crazy. But you know, that's, that's sort of one possibility. The other thing we've done is we can also make very small and very sensitive force sensors. So in my lab, we have one that actually measures the force of a Drosophila. Michael Dickinson, he used to be at Berkeley, and now Caltech, has a, he puts a Drosophila in a, um, a, it's called a fly arena. It's, usually, it's actually a virtual reality environment for the fly. It's got a whole bunch of LEDs, and they know, for example, that flies like this to, to steer towards vertical dark components. And what they do is they figure out where the fly is moving by looking at wing beat amplitude. And then they can actually control, they have the fly tethered, but they can actually make the fly feel like it's turning. We've actually developed a sensor so that we can put it on there and actually get lift and yaw. So we can actually sense what the fly is doing rather than, um, you know, than having to, to, to get it from the wing beat amplitude. And so these are sort of the, the style of sensors. Now, of course, that's way too too small. But one of the problems you have with robotic surgery, I believe, for the surgeons in here, is that the problem is also fueling tissue. Right? I mean, you know, it's like that's a problem. And so there are ways we could possibly work to get some haptic feedback, especially with the control systems described before. If they got the data, they could actually do a haptic feedback. So you could actually sort of push on something or push on the tool and get a sense that the feedback is coming back, which I think would be interesting. So I actually work mainly on trying to get stuff into bodies and out of bodies. This is a big business. This is sort of a Dean slide, because it tells you how important this deal is. Um, but it is, it is getting bigger. And one of our, our big issues here, we started doing this when we were first talking to Becton Dickinson. Actually, Bert Sage was the one who came up with some of the original ideas on that. The idea is that, um, well, one is to do, there is no, oh yeah, these screens don't work with laser pointers. I forgot. The, um, so one of the problems is, is that you have, um, unless, is this a green one? Yeah, this will work good. So what happens is one, of course, is that you could put in drugs above where, where it hurts, which is nice. My son and his friends thought I was, you, you know, my, my, thought my son had a great dad because he's going to make needles that don't hurt. But then the idea is also you could actually diffuse things into the capillary bed here. So the idea is you put a small microneedle, you're in the capillary bed in the epidermis here, and you could actually put drugs in. Now, why is this useful? Well, there are a couple of things. One is, there are a lot of drugs you want to deliver that you can't deliver through the stomach because the thing, if they're protein-based drugs, they get you know, dissolved by the liver, the, the, I mean, the, by the stomach. And that's a problem. The other one is if there's liver damage, it's also a problem. It goes through the primary pathway. So the question is, these might be useful that way. The other thing we are interested in is the potential of drill, delivering leophilized drugs and have them reconstitute just under the stratum corneum and then um, move around the body. This is sort of a history of microneedles. Um, they've been around for a while. The first work, work was done in the, uh, around 1990. And they, they were in-plane needles. They're out-of-plane needles done in 1991. These were all solid. Then hollow microneedles were started fairly early on, too. They're little passageways. And then um, microneedles that are normal to the surface were, were developed later. These were developed because they're stronger, and you can deliver more, through more drug. So, um, these were the systems we were working on. The simple idea we had is that you could put a suspension of a leophilized drug in a nonpolar solu uh, solution and put it in a flexible container that you could actually just push on and use these microneedles to actually deliver drugs just under the stratum corneum. And of course, when you do MEMS work, you've got to either put a human hair or something to compare to or you lose your reunion card. So what we do here is just put in a 26-gauge you know, needle to show how small they are. Unfortunately, these were old. These were not the best microneedles we ever made. But it shows you sort of the size difference. And part of the interesting thing for me is that subdermal, I mean, people have looked at drug delivery just under the um, epidermis. But because it's hard to get to, it's not really thought of as a, as a great way. You know, it hasn't been used very, that much. So what we did is we came up with the idea of the micro syringe. The idea here is that this is a, uh, a flexible PDMS container. There are microneedles on the top. And the blue stuff in there are particles. So being high tech, we delivered this into chicken breast because we could see through it and looked at how deep it would go. You know, because that's, we didn't, 
Berkeley, it's hard to do animal trials in general without being, you know, pilloried. And, uh, and so that, that's what we tested on, also we have no knowledge. We did find someone at UCS, oh, so the idea here is that you could actually, for third world countries, the idea would be to have these things in a blister pack. I've got this idea from my disposable, daily disposable contact lenses. Take this thing out, flip it over, and just press it against the, uh, your skin. And the idea here would be for vaccines. One, they would be leophilized, so they're more stable. And two, you, so your bo own body would, would, would um, uh, reconstitute them. And two, we, were, we thought vaccines, A, don't, we don't have to be that careful on the dosage, because that is an issue on how much actually goes in. We don't know. And then the other thing, of course, just under the skin is a great place to put a vaccine. You need much less uh, vaccine there. But we were able to find, um, we worked with, with Howard Maybeck over at UCSF, who's a dermatologist there. And what we were able to do is actually, he can, he can do experiments on people, which is, I thought was great. So we used uh, methyl nicotinate. And the idea was we just used our micro syringe and we put it on the back of a, of a regular uh, syringe body and we're able to deliver drugs. And what we could do is it'll increase blood flow and uh, vasodilation, which we can measure directly. And what was interesting is, you know, so he found 10 volunteers. I don't know where Howard gets these guys, but he pays them, I think, and gets them the next bottle of wine. Um, and so we were able to actually test, and this is sort of time to maximum um, response. And so if you just put it topically, because we know that nicotine absorbs, it, it takes 16 minutes or so. If you, um, and then when you have pointed or symmetric microneedles, we can actually deliver much faster. So it does indicate to us that we were actually able to deliver a drug just under the stratum corneum. Again, one of the, there are some significant problems that still have to be dealt with. One, how much drug you can deliver, um, you know, how much stays in the skin, how long you have to hold it, perhaps. There are a lot of issues still that have to be developed, but it's still kind of a neat idea. Um, hang on, one, one more point. And the other problem is, is these things are made out of silicon, so right now they're too expensive. And so we are trying to figure out how to make plastic microneedles, along with a bunch of other people. And the idea then is that you could actually make something that's cheap enough. Because if you talk to Beckton Dickinson, they have you know, a completed syringe, packaged, sterilized, on the loading dock, on a pallet for, less, for about two cents a piece, their cost. That probably is classified, but, or it doesn't work there anymore. So, you know, but I mean, it's that cheap. And the problem is, is our, 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 you know, if, we, if you hope a lot, the silicon might be a dollar, and that's way too much for, for a vaccine delivery. But there's still a lot of other drugs that would be interesting. Whenever the students do, um, <laughs> when our MOT, our Management of Technology students, do presentations on potential markets, they always come up with the microneedles as using it. You could use it for, botul uh, for Botox treatments, you know, because it's, 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 you know, cosmetic derm, which you can charge whatever you want for. The other thing we think we need, and this is the other thing that got, us, got me involved um, more in diabetes care, is um, sensors. So the idea, of course, is we recognize, and that's part of what Chris Peaster will talk about later, and it's also part of Citrus, I think, is um, this whole issue of why do people stay in hospitals is to be monitored. That's it. The idea, though, is that can you take this out and get home health care, elder care, and rural health care? I mean, somehow, how do you make this available to other people? And the question then is, what do you want to mon mon uh, monitor? Well, often it's just small molecules. You could do physical state, fall sensors, things like that. And that's OK. And then overall health parameters you could certainly do. And there are ways, and John Kenny can talk about that. He has ways of doing that remotely. But the thing is, is this, the sensing of small molecules, I think, has real potential. I mean, proteins would be even better, but they're actually pretty hard. Because the problem is, is when you want to monitor these things, and even these, you've got to have a trained person around. Um, you know, it's, it's checked regularly. You've got to have always people there. You only get occasional biochemical tests. And so the data is very sparse and comes in at a very low data rate, which is not a great system for really monitoring someone. So our idea was, you know, we can deliver drugs into the body. Why not pull interstitial fluid out of the body? The idea that we finally came up with, because we played around with this a bunch, is that you actually put microneedles into the interstitial fluid, and then you let diffusion pull the, the molecules out. The reason for this is that Mark Prowsitz out at, at um, Georgia Tech, for example, <laughs> learned this. He stuck some microneedles in a rat, anesthetized, and put an you know, incredible vacuum on them, and pulled out fluid over, and it took him like an hour. So it's not a really good way to pull fluid out. And I think what happens then is the tissue just you pull the fluid away, and the tissue just crams up against the microneedles. So we're, using, we're trying to use diffusion to do that. 
and then we can put sort of any, uh, any sensor here. We focused on, 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 on glucose because, one, there's a big market. It's an obvious sensor need. And, and um, I'll show you some other data that makes it important. But it could really be used for anything. So this is the, the reason I think that insulin's a good interest. I, I mean, uh, glucose is a good model. This was sort of amazing data for me. The doctors will probably notice this. But basically, if you do intensive insulin therapy in the ICU, i.e., keep people's glucose under control, you can actually reduce mortality by a factor of two. That's kind of scary to me. And also, what's weird is all these different ICU problems are reduced. And no one really knows why. But basically, your whole body is going out of whack when you're in the ICU. And this is all, oh, by the way, these problems are all regardless whether the person has diabetes or even hypoglycemia. This is the Portland data on bypass surgeries. Um, and basically, this is where normal people are down here. So if your glucose goes up because you're stressed out and, or whatever is going on, you know, if you keep your glucose under control, you can actually reduce death by a lot. So when I finally have to go in for my bypass surgery, though given the fact I'm chair of bioengineering at Burke, they'll probably go in for a stroke rather than bypass surgery, um, you know, I'm going to want my glucose checked. Now, the problem you have with this, though, which is interesting, when I was talking to a doctor from whom I got these slides at the, diabetes clinic, the clinical diabetes meeting a couple years ago, is that, oh, I didn't have that in there, sorry, is that it's hard to do this. The, the ICU nurses are doing a ton of stuff already. And, you know, even though testing glucose is a standard thing to do, and it's, you know, it's their monitors and everything, it's still difficult and it adds something else for the nurses to do. And the other scary data is when Mass General, I believe, introduced something as technologically advanced as, as barcodes, it reduced the, 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 the error rate by a factor of 10. So you've got to do something automatic and long term. So the idea is that we could, this is actually a glucose sensor. You know, all the electronics would be handled offside. The idea was that you could actually put, we could put glucose on this. And it kept moving the fluid, and that was because of the evaporation, which doesn't really work for people. But the thing is, is what we came up with was an interesting idea. The problem with glucose sensors or any microsensor that's a biosensor like this is that when you bond everything together to make a real sensor, you kill whatever enzyme you happen to have in the system. And so what we were able to find is a polymer, this is from Japan, though there are many others, that you can actually mix with whatever enzyme you want or whatever analyte you want. And then when you do is you just fill the whole channels and you expose it to UV light, it crosslinks and it holds the molecule physically. It doesn't bond with it. And it makes a porous structure. And then what you can do is rinse out the unlinked solution, and you end up with the, the, the material just around the silicon post. Okay. And so what happens is, is that this could be anything. It could be any enzyme. Uh, we use glucose oxidase. In some sense, it's cheating because glucose oxidase is an, an incredibly robust enzyme. But it was easy to get, and we could understand it and things like that. But this would be any sort of um, system I think we could put into this. Anything that would respond. And then, of course, what you do is that um, from our data, we got fairly high sensitivity in the, in the region you want for diabetes. The sensor time constant, we estimated about three minutes from a sudden onset. And this was a needle we made. This had 400 microneedles. This is actually a lie. Those, these needles aren't those needles, but it looks nice. The reason we did this big array was because it has the same surface area as the mini-med sensor. So it would actually get as much glucose out of the body as the mini-med sensor that was continuous. The problem we had is that that sensor didn't work at all. Because of the bed of nails effect, you couldn't get the microneedles into the skin. So what we did is we also had to make our microneedles longer and much more aggressive looking. And then what we were able to do is actually deliver them into the skin. This is the, the skin of, uh, of my former student, Boris. And he actually even got blood. But it was, he also had, he, how, he, how he applied this was interesting. He put the thing on the back of his hand and then hit it with a screwdriver, which of course is not really standard operating procedure in a hospital or anything. But at least we can make microneedles. We know we can get them into the skin. And so, um, and, uh, and I think what we can do here, the, th the thing I think is interesting is, is, is the idea that if you have a situation where you need to monitor someone, whether it's in an ICU or anywhere else, you need to have wireless, you need to have continuous monitoring, and we need to start going towards this, this, this regime. Now, what's hard is the only thing we've actually continuously measured, usually outside of, of fairly robust things, for small molecules is glucose. And that's actually taken a while to get accepted. There are probably a lot of other molecules. I mean, just the fact that glucose goes nuts means that you have this huge 
problem in the ICU or, or in bypass surgery, it's not just glucose, it's all sorts of stuff. But we don't know what it is because we haven't been able to measure it on a continuous basis. We don't know what the fluctuations are, I think. And so that would be really interesting. I think the other possibility with drug delivery becomes interesting in terms of new drugs could become available. I mean, there are some drugs you have to inject. And, you know, Americans just don't like to inject things, you know, and, and drug companies throw them away. But if you could make it so it's just pressing something on your, on your arm, that could be really interesting. Also, you could imagine that you could have a crash cart or I was thinking about glucagon when you have a diabetic who goes into a real problem. Um, a parent of a, of a type 1 diabetic kid told me, you know, you have this leophilized drug, glucagon. You have to, re, you know, while your child's lying there in a coma, you have to reconstitute it, pull out the syringe, you know, mix it up and deliver. And this is something we could deliver fairly rapidly. So there could be other candidates that way. Again, we'd have to do a lot of research on how, how well the drug delivers and how much. And we might have to come up with more complicated solutions, but I think it's going to be interesting. It could also lead to continuous delivery of drugs, but again, we'd have to see how to, how to put it on. It is an interesting place to deliver drugs and you get extremely rapid uptake. It's almost as fast as intravenous because it absorbs, there's such a big capillary bed there. But it would be, would be interesting. And it, of course, I suppose the other thing, if you think about robotic surgery and uh, minimally invasive surgery, there could be cases where you really want to locally deliver drugs. And this may be an interesting way to do it. I don't know. It would depend on that, you know, that, that's beyond my, my, my knowledge base. I'd have to check with, you know, I need sort of medical adult supervision on, on what would be useful or interesting. And then again with sensors. So, sorry I went a little bit long. Do I have any questions? Two, two questions, I guess, Dorian. We were just mm -hmm. talking that it's really interesting that if you're um, if you're actually doing robotic surgery on the heart um, uh, or, or anything really for that matter, um, it, maybe the, the question here is: Can you talk a little bit more about the bulk flow properties? Is it directly proportional to the surface area of the micro needles uh, and the capillary bed that you're hitting? So, for example, the hand has a good capillary bed. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Oh, would it, would it, would, but if you're in an internal organ, right? So, so I, I guess what I'm saying, what I'm wondering about is is um, uh, in terms of the bulk flow, can you get as good as a central line if you hit a large enough surface area? Is that really the limitation there? Yeah, I mean, it's across. I mean, the problem would be um, whenever you're trying to stick fluid into the body, right? If there's no gap, if there's no space there, it's going to expand it and there's going to be pressure pushing it back. And the question is, how fast does that tissue adjust to the, the increased drug um, or the, the increase in, in volume there? And so it would depend a lot on the tissue properties and. Um, I mean, of course, internal organs don't really have a capillary bed, right? So they may have a lot of capillaries. I don't know. But it would depend on the tissue. And then it, it, in terms of the bed of nails effect, mm -hmm. have you guys looked at the optimal pattern to reduce the bed of nails? In other words, uh, mm -hmm. the spread? And, We're and starting all. to play around with that. Um, and the glucose sensor is being commercialized. So those people are probably looking at that too. But there is a lot of research. If we really want to use microneedles, we do have a lot of, there's a lot of work to be done that's, I'm sorry, I tend to be really honest. You talk to Mark Prowse and he goes, oh, no, there are no problems. <laughs> but I think there are problems. Yeah. A couple of quick questions. Uh, do you have any data on how long the uh, microneedles stay patent, which would be important for long-term monitoring? And then secondly, have you thought about transcutaneous gas monitoring using this technology? No, we have not thought about trans transcutaneous gas monitoring because that would be interesting. I don't know the properties of what you need to measure there, but that would be very interesting. In terms of how long they stay open, we're not sure. We have not done any long-term testing that way. Because it's only in the, in the stratum corneum, just under the stratum corneum, we don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, response from the body. So they should stay open. And also by having a lot of them, we are hoping that that would, that would save the problem. We, we haven't done that research. We need to. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Peter Moore. I'm, I'm an anesthesiologist, so I'm really hi. excited about hearing about ways to deliver drugs to patients, and in particular, our chronic pain patients. And I'm just wondering, uh, this looks like it's got tr tremendous potential, but uh, I'm wondering just uh, how, you know, your thoughts about how this could be, how we could control delivery, how a patient could control delivery over long extended periods of time. Is there a process or way that this can be linked to uh, uh, chronic delivery of uh, very, very uh, important medicines? I think it could be. We'd have to develop a, a, a pump, pumping system, essentially, on top of this. And, but I think that would be possible. It's just a question of getting the next step. We were trying to do 
sort of the easiest, quickest thing we could do with the, with the delivery for vaccines. But I think certainly, also if you wanted very precise delivery, you'd have to have some sort of pumping system. But that's, I think that's very doable because we've come up with ways of pumping things. And it could even be to the point of just having a pressurized container and then having a, you know, a little valve with a duty cycle or some way to turn it on and off and just use duty cycle that way and measure the flow rate. So I think there's a lot of possibility. Um, the main problem you have often with these really small micro delivery systems is, is volume. Um, you know, how much can you store on the chip or, you know, how big is the volume versus how big is the chip, you know, the chip. I was thinking mini, about the mini med, uh, I'm sorry, Medtronic drug delivery hockey puck that you guys, you probably know, you know, that you, you know, this is, this is a drug delivery system. It's, it's about the size of a hockey puck. It's implanted, has a catheter, goes in the spine and delivers morphine for chronic pain patients. And when I looked at those things, it's like half battery, half drug. And if I could, you know, if I shrank the, the pump down to zero, there would be very little, <laughs> be no difference. So the question would be, you know, how, how effective would the drug be? Fentanyl would be better to use, of course, than morphine and how small we can make the system. But I think that's, actually that first slide I showed on this was a, a system we were developing for the military for, for delivery. Of course, when we mentioned fentanyl, they flipped out and said, no, we want vaccines or antibiotics. Exactly, the military's like going, ah! And it was interesting because I met the founders of, of Inhale now, Nictar. And they said, oh yeah, when we were in the military, I told them that story. One of them was in the military. He goes, I remember breaking into our uh, you know, disaster packs to find the amphetamines. <laughs> so yeah, there's, the, there's always the abuse potential for the military. They flipped out about that. The next step for me would be, what I would really like to do is, is um, hook up with someone with a real need in terms of either delivery or sensing that's different than glucose for sensing, but also uh, something where we could get, you know, probably just write an NIH proposal to, to try and figure out how well we could make these things work for delivery of real drugs for a real, for a real application. And also, you know, that would allow us to scope out how much we have to deliver, whether it's pumped, and how we could design it. And so for me, I can, I can make the microneedles, I can figure out how to make pumps, but I don't have the clinical knowledge to know how much, the, you know, what are good targets? Where is there a need? Um, yeah. And one group who I don't see represented here is pediatrics, uh, mm -hmm. pediatric intensive care. And for them, uh, blood volume loss is a big issue in drawing tests, the testing volumes. So, you know, you run potassiums very frequently, you got a certain, a certain uh, volume has to be taken out. And in very small babies, this is a big problem. So some way of having a certain set of the microneedles that draw and certain ones that return the blood while they've sensed mm -hmm. is actually quite beneficial without actually having uh, lines inside that could contract an infection, et cetera. This is probably a very effective way and a pretty big need, and that, that might be one to mm -hmm. examine. Yeah, one of the nice things is that I think the infection risk on these is much smaller because you don't have the, it's not getting, you're not gonna get any septic, sepsis problems because they're not anywhere near that area. And it's sort of, within the area that the body is still fairly heavily defended. Have you looked at what the infection rate is? No. Uh, the question is, have we looked at what the infection rate is? Um, no, we haven't. Uh, that would require, again, medical. But I don't know, the with, the, with the skin, if you're just halfway through the skin, do you think there's a big risk for? No. No, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, if you appropriately prepare your skin. And the reason why I was saying that is because um, Starting in a few weeks, Medicare has passed this uh, um, uh, new regulation saying they're not going to pay for nosocomial uh, infections. So if you have a catheter, you put in a, a PIC catheter mm -hmm. right now, you send someone home, if that becomes infected, well, they won't, rec uh, they won't compensate the hospital for uh, the care related to that because they say it's a nosocomial infection. Hmm. So you have a very interesting model. Yeah, this would, this would help solve that problem. In, in fact, this may be sort of the, the replacement for IVs, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it, you know, it, it, yeah, I don't think about it in a very loose sense, but, right, 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 yeah. right. But you, you get the, where I'm going with this, is that mm -hmm. that's sort of the way, the model to think about um, might be an effective way to look at it. Yeah. Of course, you might, might have just put up Baxter, have a, you know, hitman on me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Liebman, do you want 
um, our physicians who are interested in developing these projects to contact you directly because I can, I, yeah, I can see there's great. there's several um, areas where within the medical center this is going to be incredibly useful. Mm -hmm. um, would you be open to um, not only being contacted directly but maybe even looking at moving some of these projects into the innovation center as a, as sure. a, a lab? I'm to looking for work. any help I can to find applications for things that we develop. It's always the problem between in, you know it's the whole mm -hmm. idea. The problem with engineers is that we have these tools and we don't really know what the problems are. And so we sort of make them up or think that they're right and often they're wrong. But Well, what, I mean, that's exactly the, the rationale. And we appreciate you coming here and presenting this great information because I think one of the things that we're puzzled by as physicians is we lack some of this um, vision and some mm -hmm. of the creativity because uh, the idea and the, and the concepts that you've shown here is just really remarkable. And uh, well, I, I think you're going to get, uh, I think you're gonna get uh, uh, several... Um, different fields that would be interested. I, I know our, my colleagues in critical care are going to be very interested as well as uh, hopefully anesthesiology with regards to um, trying to develop some projects for you. Mm -hmm. No, I'd be you. very interested. I said nothing gets our students more excited than actually making something that has an impact, right? I mean, that's what my grad students love. They, you know, when DARPA used to fund our research and the program manager would come down, the students would present because they would just get them so happy about having someone interested in their stuff or having the, the idea that they're going to have impact. And so, the closer we get to a real need, the, 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 actually the better our research goes. Do you think that you can go directly into doing some human work now or do you need to do some animal work? Because one of the great advantages of the UC component of Citrus is that we have a primate center mm -hmm. and we have a veterinary school. Mm -hmm. And so do you, you could do either way. Could, either way. I mean, the, the reason I think that Howard can, he's a dermatologist, so it's easy to get people to test these things on, informed consent's easier, so he, just, he was just able to do it. And that was just something, because he, he did it because he, he knew how. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't a choice of mine. So anyway, no, I'd, I'd love to hear from anyone, except Steve, because I see him all the time. Yeah, what's up, Steve? I'm going to, actually, I'm going to uh, move this on. You better, because I'm taking your break. Time, yeah.